This week on a lively experiment, another week goes by with no movement on the state budget. And the Paw Sox Brass meets with leaders in Worcester. A lively experiment is generously underwritten by the Rhode Island Foundation, partnering with passionate Rhode Islanders to lead, transform, and inspire our state. Learn more at RhodeIslandFoundation.org. For 30 years, a lively experiment has been helping us understand the most important issues facing Rhode Islanders. Hi, I'm John Hazen White Jr., and I'm proud to be a sponsor of this great program. Joining us on this week's panel, former state representative Joe Trillo, Wendy Schiller, political science professor at Brown University, former U.S. Congressman Bob Wagan, and Pat Ford, chairman of the Rhode Island Libertarian Party. Welcome to A Lively Experiment. I'm Jim Hummel. It is great to have you with us this week. Days and weeks have now turned into a month with no end in sight to the state's budget impasse. If it sounds like a broken record, it is, as two men, House Speaker Nick Mattiello and Senate President Dominic Ruggiero continue to hold Rhode Island hostage, unable to work out a compromise to pass a $9.2 billion budget for next year. Promises of meetings in progress are starting to ring hollow for local officials who say the lack of a spending plan is causing problems uh, in a variety of ways. Joe, let me go to you first. Um, as someone who sat through this, we're in a little bit of uncharted water. Why do you think the holdup here? Why can't they get this done? It's, it's it's just one upsmanship. Uh, the Senate is trying to go one up on the House. Uh, the amendment that they've introduced has no significance. It's not necessary. Uh, it's just trying to exert pressure and power onto the House. What they should do is the, the ball is in the Senate's court right now. So if you're going to blame anybody for holding up the budget, you can blame the Senate. The House passed it, sent it to the Senate. It went through Senate finance, the House version, and it was approved. It's all teed up, ready for them to vote on it. You know, and the amendment can simply be added later on. They could go to the Speaker and say, give me a promise that we'll add the Speaker when you come back in We'll add this amendment when you come back in January. You know, Maureen Moakley made a great point last week, the way the, se the, way the uh, session ended last year where uh, the speaker basically left a lot of stuff on the table that maybe there was some residual bad feeling in the Senate. I don't know if that's true. We may never know. Well, a lot of times that's what happens is the, the personalities at the very end of the session, because there's so much going on, so many bills flying back and forth, uh, these kinds of things happen. But I think Joe's right in that there's just a little bit of one-upsmanship that's going on in both the House and the Senate. I think this week you're going to see it's passed. The Senate will pass it, and then the House will uh, do whatever it has to do, and it'll be all resolved, hopefully by the uh, 1st of August, maybe by the 3rd of August, something like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything that's been said. I think it's good that they're talking. You know, my line is always, Rhode Island's a pretty small state. Why they can't sit in a room and yeah. work this out is kind of amazing. And there was a graphic uh, just posted, you know, most states have finished their budget. Illinois actually adopted a budget after several years. So Rhode Island's one of the outstanding states that hasn't done it. But I think that they have to make sure that it'll go smooth sailing. If they call everybody back to do this, there can't be any other hitch and any other bills that get stuck. And there were some bills left on the table that are really important. So I think working out the other stuff, not just the car tax issue, but everything, making sure it goes smoothly, that I think is what's holding Before them now. Before they come out in public. Yeah, but exactly. I don't think they can come back and start dealing with other bills. They just have to deal with the budget and get that resolved and get away. And they'll come back with some promises for perhaps in January to deal with those other bills that are well, important. But once you come back, Bob, you open that can of worms. That's right. You exactly. do. That other Absolutely. members are going to want their bills passed. So it has so to be limited yeah, to the it, budget. But you can't really limit it. So and, and once actually, that's they not know a bad you're idea. back, it's a problem. That's actually not a bad idea to actually have them come back in session. But ultimately, my first question is, Rhode Island, the size and scope of Rhode Island government. Is it time, for example, to, and, and by the way, we had an opportunity a few years back to have a constitutional convention. We chose to pass on that as a state. Is it time to, in the next one, re-engineer the way we do business here in Rhode Island? Number one, unicameral versus bicameral legislature. Is there a need for this overwhelming government presence in a state the size literally of Brooklyn? Number two, do we need to re-engineer the governor's powers so that he or she at least has some type of equal footing? And I guess the great crisis du jour of this week is state aid to cities and towns. Now, riddle me this, 
we give money as taxpayers to the state who then redistributes it to the towns. Is it time to, understanding the challenges of communities like Pawtucket, Central Falls, and Providence, is it time to do away with this aid to cities and towns, introduce some type of fiscal responsibility to municipal government so that they have to at least attempt to stand on their own and then distribute state aid as truly necessary? The entire system is a mess. I thought it was odd that the governor, they had the, they had the community leaders up there, but it was in, in private. Wouldn't you want to get all of that out and to have, you know, all the mayors saying, look, this is why we need. I, I almost wonder the governor, I think of that Three Stooges episode where Mo took Larry and Curly and, you know, bonked their heads <laughs> together and you heard the coconut sound. I, I don't know. Why is the governor what? not getting them well, together? Well, she had, I mean, I don't know that it was so private. I mean, there was this, there were a bunch of photos were released of the governor meeting with all of the mayors from the city. And but that was after the right, but they That was after the day. But the then meeting. after that, the Various mayors and towns went to the it's press all and sanitized, talked about it. Yeah. yeah, but I don't know that we need to see all that per se. We just need to see that the that the mayors of uh, of these towns are putting pressure on the state senators and the house members to come back. The biggest issue I think that the mayors are concerned about is what they do with the tax bill. Uh, it's a simple solution. Pass the tax bill, it, it, send out the tax bills, don't hold them up. You know this budget's going to get passed, and none of the controversy is about the tax bill. Right. So send the car tax bills out as if it's based uh, as if, on the budget. As if it was pass. passed. And then if for some reason you have to go back and amend it, which I could probably guarantee you there's a 99% chance it's going to be passed the way it's in the budget, and you're not going to have to go back and amend it. But don't let quarters go by without sending out um, these I got contacts. my car tax bill. Uh, no, yeah. Oh, yeah. So many of the communities have not. Uh, okay. They, well, Providence. All over it. Um, let me, Providence uh, has definitely sent out the car tax bill. Before we move on, I just wanted to run some uh, sound we had on this week's Hummel Report. I sat down with four freshman lawmakers, actually at the beginning of the session and now at the end, to talk to them about their impressions. You know what they might do differently going into the next uh, session. But I talked to Representative Jason Knight and Senator Janine Kalkin, and they talked about this budget impasse. Of course, it's new for them too, and this is their reaction to what's been going on since June 30th. I thought, wait a minute, this is not how it's supposed to go. <laughs> it's not the script they gave this us. Is not, this is not, you know, I've been watching politics for a long time. This is not how the end of Rhode Island's legislative season happens. And I, you know, frankly, have been, you know, that was June 30th, the weekend, the Friday before the 4th of July weekend. And I've been thinking about it every day since, trying to parse like just what exactly is going on behind the scenes that caused this breakdown between the House and the Senate. And what keeps going through my head uh, as the days go by is uh, kind of the doctor's rule, right? Do no harm. And the longer this goes on, there's going to be some harm. And I would like to get back to the table. I know some of the people who spent hours coming here, you know, once a week, or they knocked on doors all over Rhode Island trying to get these bills to pass. And, you know, it's, it's really tough. Um, to, to think that that effort could be wasted. All right, so we will see what happens in the coming week. Moving on, new developments this week in the case of Frank Montanari heads up the uh, uh, JCLS, basically runs the legislature. Uh, Channel 12 had an interesting story in that uh, when he interviewed, uh, of course, he got the free tuition for his kids at Rick. He had said, well, everybody gets this. Well, now the documents come up. Well, it seems like we've talked about this every time you've been on the show, but now the documents show he was a party of one, basically getting this special mm -hmm. treatment. Well, I... I we haven't seen all of it. We haven't seen a document. It's a, uh, as you said, this, this is a very unique and singular kind of activity. So uh, what I'm hoping that is that the Attorney General, Peter Kalmatin, is going to come out with some resolution of this very shortly. The report's been uh, handed to him by the state police, and they did it very quickly, so I assume that there's not too much there other than a unique, uh, unorthodox kind of agreement. Okay. This speaks to the greater ill, though. This state is larded, and I use that term intentionally, with six-figure middle-income salaries for jobs that either are political in nature or require no oversight, nor do they have any sort of, I don't know, requirements. Any, 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 there's no meat there. So what needs to happen is twofold. Obviously, an arrangement like this can never, ever happen again. But at the same time, we need to understand why Mr. Montanaro is being compensated so handsomely for essentially a political job that really has no bearing on the lives of average Rhode Islanders. So as every issue happens in Rhode Island, there's the symptom and then there's the cause. Do you think we're ever going to get the full story on this? Well, I just want to know, I'm not, I haven't been following enough whether he's actually started to pay it back or not. I know he said he would. But has he started? Do we know if he's paid back the money or he plans to return the money? They can easily dock it from his salary. We know that, right? Goes right back into the state treasury. I want to know that he's paid it back. If he's paid it back, 
They made a mistake. He took a benefit he shouldn't have taken. He pays it back. I think we can move on. I think we have to make sure this doesn't happen again. But if he hasn't paid it back and he's kind of hedging on that, that's a much greater concern to me because then there's no punishment. Well, I think there were more than one person. He wasn't the only one that got that benefit. I think they found three or four other people that got some sort of benefit. Not at three years, though. Well, I, I, I don't know how many years it was. The bottom line is, is that if there was anything done here that was shady or illegal, I think we need to get to the bottom of it. But if it was, as he said, something that was okayed by people uh, as being okay, then, you know, who do you blame? All right. The uh, Paw Sox monogamous, monogamous relationship with the city of Pawtucket uh, has ended. Now they're uh, beginning to go to the city of Worcester. Uh, some other cities have made some overtures. I'm not sure Worcester is going to be the solution here, but, you know, obviously something Pawtucket has to pay attention to. I get the feeling a lot of Rhode Islanders are like given all the 38 studios, which we keep coming back to. They're like, you know what? If they leave, it may not be the end of the world. But you have to take the broader, longer view about economic development in Rhode Island. And I think you have to weigh the cost of the taxpayer contribution, both in the Pawtucket side, actually, and then the state side, against what it would be for the economy and for Pawtucket for redevelopment uh, over five, ten years. So if you amortize that amount of money that we're going to put in over ten years on a $9.2 billion budget, it's not that much money. Whether it's worth it or not, I don't know. But I've now seen a clear argument about what it will bring five, ten years down the line. And that's what Rhode Islanders have to be thinking about, the future, not being stuck in the past on 38 Studios. The property that they're talking about where the former Apex used to be would be an ideal kind of a property for redevelopment as a gateway to Rhode Island, etc. But Wendy's right about the amount of money that the state is putting into it. If, if the state is really putting in something that doesn't have the rate of return that they're anticipating, it's not worth it. And I grew up in Pawtucket, I played ball in McCoy Stadium, and I really love the idea of the Poor Sox staying there. Uh, and I think they should. I think we should get back to the table, and by January or the latest, February, it's come up with a resolution. But it should not be as deep in terms of the taxpayer money going into it. It should be more coming from the owners of the Paw Sox. And if they can make a deal, fine. If not, go to Worcester. Why do I think the term 38 stadium might come out of your mouth? <laughs> Is that possible? <laughs> well, first off, on the way home from my first Worcester Sox game, remind me to stop and pick up my Hartford Patriots tickets. <laughs> All right. Each is as likely to happen. Um, the Worcester economy really cannot, despite its renaissance and how many you know economies in the country now are, are each going under their own self-described renaissance as mainly as a pr promotional tool but the Worcester economy is not going to support the Pawtucket Red Sox in the same way that the Providence south of Boston economy will. To the economic point First of all, it's absolutely wrong at any level for government to be involved in the subsidization of any private enterprise. Number two, a stadium by no means provides any level of economic development for a community. It hasn't been proven. Feel the schemes. Talk to uh, the professor from Holy Cross. By and large, those type of investments actually act as a drain on the local economy because the functionality of buildings are insular in nature. All of the revenue stream is dedicated inward. That's why they're building the stadium. If they do that on their own dime, that's great. That's the free market. That's free enterprise. But what folks continue to fail to account for is that the largest entertainment venues in this state are monopolistic in nature, whether they be Twin River, whether they be this new stadium, whether they be the convention center. And by definition, they siphon business away from other Rhode Island businesses that had to do it the right way with their own sweat equity and their own risk capital. That type of madness has generationally failed. It needs to stop now. Well, if I could believe the prospectus that's been put out there that it's going to cost the, the taxpayers uh, about 20-something million dollars, and I was reassured uh, through substantial documentation that they were going to generate that additional money. So, in essence, the taxpayers really were going to be reimbursed. It's far, This is a very different thing than 38 Studios. This has an opportunity to rejuvenate a city that's that's been uh, a distressed community for years. There's absolutely no proof of that on There's any no fundamental what, level that it's going to provide community? that it's going to provide any sort of economic viability you to know, the city. Every, of well, you're, you're, you come from the area that no money ever should go into anything for economic. Guess what? The track record I think of this if you government can is save a dismal failure. In a case you like won't this, save a city. You'll actually cost local you, businesses money because you're well, taking the entertainment dollar from a closed that's economy. Your can no, I that's get actually, my opinion. That's actually PhD economics. Can you listen to my opinion? My opinion is that it will generate income in the in the downtown area of Pawtucket. 
and it will help them a lot. But I'm not saying I'm willing to just give them a, a blank check. What should have been done is they should have gone out for a vote. Let the people make a decision on it. Even if we had to have a special election and let them pay for the special election. Uh, the, the bottom line is you can't turn your nose on every opportunity at economic development because of 38 students. Well, and you also an wonder, entirely different You also situation. wonder if they had not spent their capital, good capital, uh, public on will capital, on Providence. Right. Is this something that might through. Well, and, what and, you and, as and, is. And I disagree with Pat because I think there are things, regardless of the report, I think there are things that they could do at the stadium. This cannot be just a stadium if it's going to be at Apex. It has to be other multi uses and activities. And that's how they pitch it. And that's and what they're they proposing. And it has, to be, it has to be really a commercial activity that's running all year long. If it does that, it will generate taxes, it will generate income tax from employees, it will do a lot of good for Pawtucket and the state of Rhode Island. But the return on the investment, $20, $22 million, has to be. Be true. If it's not true, then we have to reduce the amount of investment yeah, by the state right. and, right. and go forward. Fundamental economics. There is a limited amount of disposable income in any one given economy. To the degree with which you subsidize and create monopolies, then give artificial advantages to businesses that are cronyist in nature, you then take money away from other businesses. I've asked the town of Cumberland, the town council formally, to introduce a resolution opposing public subsidies for this stadium. And the reason why is that because Cumberland businesses will suffer. That money that which would be spent locally and will have a far significantly greater multiplier effect into the local economy will instead be siphoned off to other businesses, the two being Twin River and this proposed stadium. These do not create economic activity. Look at cities across the nation. They have been abject failures in that type of halo effect, ancillary development. It's a fiction. You and I'm the, citing specific facts. You want well, the last word on that? <laughs> yeah, well, I, just somewhere in between. First of all, I, I, I lean towards this. I, I see your argument. I think it depends on the activity you're spending your money on. So not all activities, economists will tell you, are transferable equally. Right? They're not, right. So if I love baseball, there's not going to be another activity I want to do that's going to mean as much to me. But I agree with you on the, on the idea that we need to know exactly where the money will go and if we're going to make money back, and that it is unfairly subsidizing people who already have a lot of money, the owners of the Paw Sox. Also, transportation. If we do it, let's do it right, which is to be able to get people from all over the state and all over different communities to be able to go to attend these games, not just build a really nice parking lot for people with cars. So one of the things we want to think about is if it really is going to be a public use space, make sure you have all the pieces of this puzzle, which will cost more money, which will make Pat very unhappy. But that's very important. Thinking of it as economic development, meaning all the pieces of economic development, to make as great an outreach to as many people in the state as possible. The problem is we're already subsidizing Pawtucket as a distressed community. If we can strengthen a di distressed community to some level where they stronger to stand on their own two feet, I think it helps the community. This would be a staple. I mean, it's like saying that what, what the Patriots did with Patriots Place was a, was a bad investment. It was a bad deal. Go up there. Go it's up a there. success a story. It. It was a now, private now, I'm not going to compare this well, to Patriots Place, but I am going to tell investment. you, you put a stadium like this in downtown Pawtucket, and you surround it with some businesses, and you're going to help rejuvenate the city of Pawtucket, and you're going to keep an asset in the state. All right. To be continued. Uh, <laughs> to be continued. Uh, a lot going on in the national scene, including from our own senior senator, Jack Reed, who learned maybe the hard way that uh, the microphone, uh, you should think that it's always on. He was in a, a conversation with fellow Senator Susan Collins after a hearing, and the headline was that he said that he thought President Trump, uh, Trump was uh, crazy. <laughs> Crump. Uh, was crazy. Uh, you know as a politician that uh, maybe there are things that you think that shouldn't be said publicly. You do, and, and I've known Jack for over 30 years. I, he's an intelligent, dedicated public servant. It seems very out of character, right? Uh, it is, but I'll tell you this, he was being sincere and honest, and as I said earlier, uh, off the air, I think his popularity uh, numbers just went up five to eight percent because it showed a human side to Jack Reed that we who know him uh, know that he's this kind of person. But he's sincere about it. And just take a look at what's happened over the last week. Every time we turn around, there's chaos in the White House, chaos in their press office, chaos within the Attorney General's office. You name it, they're uh, chaotic. And to a certain degree, crazy. Before we get into that, uh, all of that, the rest of that, you have a different take on the... Oh, I, I've only met Jack Reed a few times, uh, but he's impressed me, as Bob said. Very intelligent, very articulate, very sincere uh, politician and leader and former military man. My personal take is he knew the mic was on, and uh, it was it was a chance for him to kind of let seep into the body, body politic his real opinion. And by the way, he's right. 
<laughs> I, I said it was a modern day form of chivalry, not the Trump quote, but what he said afterwards about uh, this. Uh, uh, you person, could knock the out yeah, of, that out of guy. this uh, um, um, congressman from Texas who wanted to challenge Susan Collins Susan to a no. duel if she was uh, a man. I mean, the amount of sexism in the whole thing was sort of stunning in 2017. But it was great that Jack Reed said, "Oh, you know, you could, uh, you know, you could take this guy." And I was impressed with that chivalry, although I think he might have wanted to use different language if he hadn't been. On Did you think the guy was unattractive? I thought that was unnecessary too. I mean, what is? You don't have to make fun of people's appearance or degrade them as human beings to oppose them politically. Joe, let's get into the larger. You know, yeah. if you, if you want to, I don't. First of all, I don't criticize for Jack Reed for calling somebody crazy. That, call me crazy for saying I don't criticize him for being saying it. I think that what he means is not to be taken literally. I think the fact that he's he may be saying he doesn't like his behavior and that's a way of exaggerating to say it to make a point. But if Donald Trump is crazy, guess what? I want to be that crazy. I want to be able to run a $10 billion company and build that co have built that company. He's I want to be able States to beat now, 16 people, governors and U.S. senators in a race for president. If that's crazy, then you know what? Well, let's talk I about what's crazy. happened the last week, though, with some of the stuff going on. He's brought on a yeah, communications I, I guy I, who really doesn't know communications. He knows business. You know, I don't want to criticize to the level that some people will do. But have I seen some missteps come out of the, uh, the West Wing? Absolutely. And I think some of the things that happened in the last couple of weeks are, are somewhat out of control. Are they avoidable mistakes, though? They're avoidable mistakes. As we tell our immature, kids, they're mistakes they're and then they're mistakes. Avoid okay. they're, they're people that are in this White House right now that really don't have the political expertise. And let me tell you this, I don't trust Rice Priebus. I worked with him when I was National Committee man, and I saw what he did to the chairman of the, of the RNC. He undermined that chance. So why does the president fire him? Because the, the president doesn't know to that level how much oh. you can't trust. Right. No, no, it's Paul Ryan. I think it's Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan is, is his is, protector. Is ve I, I think implicitly, Paul Ryan goes way back. Scott Walker, Paul Ryan, Ryan's previous, they are pretty tight. They just announced that factory accidentally going to be built in the Speaker's District in Wisconsin. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I think that there is a little bit more pressure to keep rents from that angle of the party, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not privy to that. I, I, I disagree because, well, the relationship with Paul Ryan. Ryan and, and Priebus is there. But the fact is that this is the president's White House. And if he can't trust someone within his office, he has to take the action. And he can't be listening to the speaker or a Senate a majority leader to protect this person. It's his White House, it's his cabinet. Saying that, uh, what has happened with the mooch over the last uh, few days is just absolutely, without doubt, one of the craziest things I've ever seen happen in a White House ever. Uh, it's just wrong for him to be saying what he's been saying. He isn't a communications director. He's just shooting from the hip. But I think also he's doing that because he wants distraction away from the issues that have been plaguing Trump, meaning the issues with Russia, the issues with regard to foreign trade. Those are jokes. Those are joke issues. There has been nothing substantial that's come out about Russia other than he put Russian dressing on his salad. Well, the fact is we're still doing the investigation. We haven't come to the conclusion of that yet. If something was there, it would have come out by now. Joe, what about the way he's treated Jeff Sessions? Well, again, I don't think he should have criticized them outwardly. I think if you have a problem with him, but I think his criticism of him is justified. I think he's upset with them. Isn't that something you talk about behind closed doors? Absolutely. You should be. Absolutely. You, absolutely. Well, you, Every you, other are, president you, has. Yeah. Are you saying to me that someone with Jeff Sessions' involvement shouldn't have recused himself? I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, I don't want to make that judgment call. What I'm saying is that Jeff Sessions has been moving forward with a lot of Trump's issues, but there are issues like the leaks that are coming out of the FBI that, that Jeff Sessions could have been on. The leaks in government are, are, are creating monumental problems. Let's talk about the larger issue of the Republicans were supposed to be able to go home, you know, in August with these great triumphs. We have all three branches, you know, we have the, uh, the House, the Senate, and the presidency. Instead, there's some Republicans who are looking at their people back home saying, well, maybe we don't want to <laughs> repeal the Affordable Care Act. And you had done a little research on that in terms of uh, yeah, I mean, I think the effect was, on the constituents. Right. So what was driving, I think, the, 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 the holdout Republican senators and then some other ones, Shelley Moore Caputo um, and Dean Heller from Nevada, who's up for re-election, uh, was s simply the idea that you would roll back the Medicaid expansion quickly. And these states are 20, 25, 29 percent Medicaid. So I think that 
that when you think about the dependence on Medicaid in some of these states for the Republicans, and they're hearing from their governors, we're going to make up that money. If the feds pull out, we got to cover these people, what are we going to do? So I think that was driving their strong reluctance on the version of replace and repeal that the Republicans were dealing with in the Senate this week. Um, and then it became, well, we can't do that one. That's not going to pass. Let's do this other one. And they wrote the bill at lunch. It was eight pages or something. It's just not the way to run a rodeo. It's not the way to legislate in the Senate. I'm not saying they shouldn't try to repeal it. That's what they promised to do. But they've got to figure a way to replace it. They have committees. They have experts. They have staff. They've been thinking about this for seven years. How is it that they don't have a program? The fact of the matter is even the bill that was presented last night, the skinny repeal bill, was a skeleton of a bill and there was nothing really there. You have to give John McCain a lot of credit for getting up at the, the early hours and saying, I'm voting no on this bill because it really killed it. The Republicans need to come up with some substantial ways of, first of all, doing this, making sure the insurance pool stays whole. If you then allow people to get out of the insurance pool, other p costs are going to go up. You can't have that. Second part of it is that there are people, as Wendy said, that are being cared for right now. All of a sudden, you're going to pull the rug out from under them and say, we're not going to care for you. Those people in nursing homes, those people that rely on uh, health care medicine from Medicaid, you can't do that. You just can't do it. Whether it's Alaska or whether it's Maine, there's going to be far more that are going to get here at, over the, the summer months that we cannot do away with this kind of bill until we have a full coverage and some other methodology. Well, to Wendy's point, eight years of complaints, eight years of whining, eight years of, you know, fash out reactions and votes that they knew they would never win, when given the opportunity to actually govern, whether it be taxation, whether it be foreign policy, or in today's events, health care, the Republicans have been an absolute failure at promoting any type of coherent, cogent legislation. They have had eight years to work on this. We see nothing because there's no underlying core philosophy anywhere. It's always been a matter of political convenience. Why would we expect that to change what now? What about that, Joe? Let me just say, about the eight years, uh, I don't want to defend the Republicans because I'm really upset with the three that held out. But I will tell you that if you're a member of, of, of the, the Senate, as, they, uh, as the Republicans were, and you don't have control of that Senate, there's not a lot that you're going to get done without a, a Republican president. So to say to work on it, it takes a lot of work to work on it. Maybe they should have had something ready. But the bottom line is, if you don't know you, you've got a president in the White House that's going to sign it, you're not gonna. You're not gonna put a lot of time in work. And that's a great point that Joe Charlo is making. And so now they've got a president who's a Republican, right, right. sort of, yes. in the White House, who could put Tom Price and some other good but you know what? heads Let me tell together you this about and working, figure it out. But working with a caucus, what you can't do, and that's what these three have done. These three are saying we're smarter than the rest of you 47 guys. Well, that's not that's the truth. Oh, sure it is. John McCain said, we're gonna, "Give me a we're bill. Show me a bill." And the whole wasn't a bill there at all. Because that's what's more, the bill. Because okay. what's more important okay. is the Republican Party, here's right, not the country. Here's and a, that's here's the a problem. Folks, you're going to have to hold it because I owe you outrages next time you come on. That's 30 minutes, and that's Get it. Out of here. I want, exactly, I know. We're going to go to an Can hour next time. Now, Joe, we're going to book an hour every time you come on. All right, uh, that is all the time we have for, unfortunately, Joe and Wendy and Bob and Pat. We will continue this. I'm so, sorry you won't be able to see it, but after the show ends. Uh, but we hope you come back here next week as the Lively Experiment continues. Have a great weekend, everybody. A Lively Experiment is generously underwritten by The Rhode Island Foundation, partnering with passionate Rhode Islanders to lead, transform, and inspire our state. Learn more at RhodeIslandFoundation.org. For 30 years, A Lively Experiment has been helping us understand the most important issues facing Rhode Islanders. Hi, I'm John Hazen White, Jr., and I'm proud to be a sponsor of this great program.